And Cara, you're next on my screen. Good morning. Um, my name is Cara Romano. I'm calling in from Ellsworth. Thanks. Nancy? Hi, Nancy Ketch. I'm the Community Development Director with the Town of Fulton and work with the downtown group. And Johanna? Johanna Johnston. I'm the Executive Director of the Southern Neuristic Development Corporation. Ari? Hi, uh, I'm Ari Amaker. I'm with Discover Downtown Westbrook. I've just joined there as uh, actually their AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer. Yeah. Awesome. Great to have you. And Dave. Dave Bogel in Rockland, Maine. Delilah. Vernon, Delilah Papour, Heart of Biddeford. Angie. Angie Presby, Saco Main Street in Saco. Nice. Abby. Hi, I'm Abby Leibowitz, Assistant Director of Heart of Biddeford. Amy. Amy Grimms Pulaski, Discover Downtown Westbrook. Amanda. Is it just me today? Yes, you're the only Amanda, Amanda so far. <laughs> uh, Amanda from Main Street Bath. Christina. Christina from Main Street Skyhegan. And Terri Ann. Oh, we can't hear you, Terri Ann. You were off mute. We're going to come back to you. Um, we've got a couple guests, and then we'll come back to Terri Ann, who's here with DECD, but we'll hear from her. Uh, Joan. Yeah, Joan Drapo uh, from Slick Fix. I'll, I'll be demonstrating today. Yeah, one of our guest speakers. And then we've got um, AJ with you as well. Yep, AJ, I work at Slugbanks. Great. Thanks for being here. And Joe from DECD is another speaker presenter for the second half. Well, I just realized I was completely turned off. I apologize for that. No problem. I'm Joe Neeson. I'm with uh, DECD. I represent, I work with Julia on all of the ARPA projects um, currently underway through DECD. Thanks, Joe. Good to see you. And Terry, and how about you? Try again. No, still not getting the audio, but you can hear us. Well, Terry Ann Holden is one of our advisory council members. And um, so she's been in this work a long time. She works for the DECD um, and um let's see oh for the Anne could chime in and say exactly your role <laughs> works with cdbg yes i was just about to say that part <laughs> <laughs> thank you nancy since i couldn't get to my mute awesome um so we will yeah amanda did you have something i just had something i know we were holding space for like a moment about what happened and i had a main street question about what happened and how it pertains to our roles. And I didn't know if we had like 30, 60 seconds to, or do you want me to wait till the end? I, you know, I guess we, because we've got the presenters slotted for time that they were going to start a few minutes ago. Um, and I worry that right. it's not a 30 second I conversation, I but I, I want to let's, let's create time at the end for that because it's important. And um, it's a good, really good question for the group. Thanks, Amanda. So um, Joan is going to present first for us. And Joan, I'm just going to make you a co-host so that you have the ability to share screen. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Let me see if I can do that. OK, let me get rid of this pesky floating meeting controls. I'm sure that everybody's have the same problem with that. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, we can see your browser. Okay. Yep. Can see? We can see okay. it. Everybody okay? Yep. Okay, great. All righty. Well, thank you for your time today and thank you for having me. My name is Joan Drapo. I am the CEO and co-founder of SlickPix. SlickPix um, helps entrepreneurs and organizations improve their engagement and increase uh, increase engagement and improve their customer experiences using our patented interactive images, patented interactive videos, and rich multimedia stories. 
So today, first of all, I'm going to be demonstrating the downtown Main Street's maps and how interactivity can um, bring them to life. So I think I'd like to thank Augusta and Bath for allowing us to use their maps and um, to bring them to the next level as well as demonstrating our innovative technology. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, the Upstart Navigator. So the Upstart Nav Navigator is made with SlickPix technology. Um, Upstart is an organization up in Bangor um, who help entrepreneurs find services that they need to scale and grow. Um, Evan Rickhart is the head of Upstart, and he approached us about a year ago and asked us um, about the technology and if he can, if we thought we can make an interactive streetcar map. Some of his perimeters were four train lines representing different stages of business, eight neighborhoods representing services for those businesses, and 41 organization service providers that provide the services for those particular um, uh, entrepreneurs. Some other things we discussed was the online audience and the online journey. Um, we first um, talked about the ability uh, the, that a lot of online uh, consumers are on over 130 web pages a day, which is shocking to me, on multiple channels, on multiple devices. And if they make it past the normal eight second attention span into consideration, the content that they see needed to be fast and personalized. And especially personalization was really important for Upstart because they were going to be having businesses, the mom and pop shops that have Facebook as their website and the enterprise type of businesses. So it needed to be personalized for that whole realm of types of businesses. And then if it made it past the conversion uh, of finding out more information from the actual organizations, it needed to be shareable for all of the um, all of the um, entrepreneurs network. So then we can then bring an additional group of entrepreneurs into the awareness. And so this is what we ended up with. So this is the Upstart Navigator. This navigator here, um, it has been live for about a month, but it's been um, online for a little bit longer and it has over a thousand views thus far. Um, what, um, what Upstart did is they took our tool and they outlined each of these items on this image to make it interactive. Um, once they made it interactive, then they can attach what we call a bubble and the bubble can have images, it can have videos, it can have text in it, and it can have a call to action, which is what they've done with the lines here. So here are the four lines that he was envisioning. Each one of them represents a different stage of a business. And at this point, then we can click on the call to action. And we brought to the second level of the navigator, which is the eight neighborhoods. Some of the, um, the four lines, let's say the Main Street won't have all eight neighborhoods, but it just whatever is relevant for them. So at this point, we've got um, pitch competitions, advisory, networking, ex uh, you know, accelerators, and you can click on, let's say, funding, and you're brought to the third level of the navigator, which is the actual service providers for the um, entrepreneurs. Um, at this point, we've got uh, main venture fund, CEI. Um, so each one of these, then you have a call to action. And this call to action brings us to a multimedia story, which Upstart has created with images, text, video, social sharing, which I'll go to in a minute, um, social sharing, images, text, video, and then, of course, the call to action, which goes directly to the MTI website. So let's go back out of here, and we're going to close this. So we're going to go back to the front of the navigator here. So as you can see, um, Upstart Maine, like a lot of other businesses, will have social sharing icons, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, Instagram. But if you click on this, you're brought directly to Upstart Maine, obviously to Upstart Maine's Facebook page. So what I'm talking about with social sharing, I'll give you a demonstration here, um, is if you have this particular story, for example, and here are their social sharing icons here, so if we click on this Facebook here, we're brought to your own social, not to Upstart Maine's Facebook, but I'm brought to my Facebook. And at this point, I can say something and I can post it. And at that point, anybody that comes along to my social channel clicks on it and is brought exactly to the space where I shared it from, which is the navigator on upstartmaine.org 
with this particular story. So that's a little bit different of uh, what the social sharing is on the, um, the slick pick stories. So now we're gonna go back in over here and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the funnel, the, the, the um, upstart main subscribed. And once they subscribed, they were able to um, choose an administrator for their SlickPix account. And that administrator then, they, they chose Heather Lux to be their administrator. Then that administrator then was able to invite content creators of which she invited the um, service providers on the navigator, like the MTIs and the main venture funds. So she invited them to be able to create their own stories on that navigator. So they used the easy story blocks, um, copy and paste, um, drag and drop images, and then they created their stories. Once the stories were created, they clicked a button that says story ready. And then it was up to Heather at that point to say, you know, that's great. I'm gonna approve it or no, let's do some edits. Once that story is fully ready, then it gets published onto the navigator, which is located on SlickPix or on um, Upstart's website. Now that navigator can also be published on multiple websites. So let's say MTI or Main Venture Fund or the Angels, they would like the navigator on their website and that can be done as well. That's known as content syndication. So now we've got the navigator on multiple websites, right? Um, and remember those social sharing blocks. So now the, the navigator then can be shared across all social and online channels by anyone who sees the navigator on every one of those websites. And the network on the social channels are then brought back to the exact story on the exact website where that story was shared from. So that helps to really spread that content of the Upstart Navigator. Now, the last piece of this funnel is to analyze the content. So uh, SlickPix gathers analytics on consumers' traits only, but also additionally can be integrated with Google to get more robust um, analytics on, um, on that navigator. So now we're gonna go in to see um, on the Main Street main and how it can work for Main Street. So here's a mock-up, a mock-up, right, <laughs> of Main Street's website. So at this point, we've got, um, the whole state of Maine at this point, right? And each one of these items then can be interactive. So you can have each one of these towns interactive. So for this demonstration, we're gonna use Bath. So now we've gone from a state level to a region level. Now this is the region of Bath. So each one of these items then can have, you know, stories um, and, 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 and such. So here's an example of, this is the Maine Maritime. You know, it's got information and um, of course, uh, a link to the website. And now we're gonna go into the actual downtown of Bath. So here's an example. We've gone from a state level to a region level to a downtown level. And at this point, we can go even further. So this is Front Street. And of course, each one of these sections of this map can be made interactive, right? So now if we go into the first section of Front Street, now we've gone all the way to a building on Front Street from the state level, and now we can say, okay, so here's an example of now you're cooking. Gives, they've created a bubble and, and a link to their website. So each one of these buildings then can have a little information in a bubble and a link to the website or a link to a richer story if that's what they would like. So, and it, it just goes a little bit further into some detail uh, right within the front street. And of course, you don't have to have the bubble. So what I can demonstrate in the second area of the front street is that we've created a direct link, let's say to one of the businesses. It doesn't have to have a bubble. It can go to directly to one of those businesses. Let me go over and use my back button here. So that's an, a little bit of example of how it can be um, used all the way down into the downtown main street level. But it's not only um, making maps interactive, what we also also offer is the ability to make your business directories interactive as well. So here's an example. Once again, it's a mock-up of Visit Bath's website. And here's an example of galleries of particular, you know, instead of the, um, the list of the directory, you can make it uh, visually appealing with, um, with galleries. 
here's a gallery of all of the um, entrepreneur services that um, that can that um, entrepreneurs could need. Um, here's an example of a gallery of gifts and shopping. These are all the businesses on that downtown Main Street, right? And here's an example of um, main activities, for example. So you can make galleries specifically um, which galleries uh, would be interesting interesting for the businesses that are part of the Main Street. At this one, I've done a just a demonstration of the Coastal Botanical Gardens. And at this point, it's gone more than just a bubble, but a full-fledged multimedia story about the coastal main botanical gardens. It could be interactive. It can show, you know, a little bit more information about the, the gardens. Here's uh, those social sharing icons that I just demonstrated. And of course, then a direct call to action to go buy some tickets to go to the gardens. So that's an example of how the activities one works. So if you go into the dining one, for example, here's, an, here's one of the Taste of Maine. We all know this one, right? Um, so the Taste of Maine could be a content creator under the Main Street Maine account. They can go in and create this story. They can introduce the, the wait staff. They can say what's new in the news. Um, they can talk about what they have on their menu. For example, they have prime rib while supplies last. Well, let's say that they don't have prime rib one, one Friday. They just didn't, it didn't come in on the truck or whatever. They can go in and edit this content and immediately can be reflected everywhere that this content is placed. They click story ready, the administer, administrator clicks publish, and all of a sudden, everywhere that this particular story is, the content is changed. And that is keeps it keeps everybody agile and it's called dynamic. So that's how it would work as a gallery. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I know I've got a short amount of time, so I'm gonna wrap it up here really quickly. Um, first of all, um, okay, so what's in it for the entrepreneur ecosystem builders? You um it creates a central hub for community building. Uh, the content is shareable on multiple websites like we just demonstrated. It's socially shareable with that, those social sharing icons, customized colors and fonts. So let's say MTI wanted to put that navigator on, it takes on the fonts and, and can be customized with colors for MTI's website. Real-time publications, such as the example with the menu, hosted by Slick Picks. This is a big one because sometimes those multimedia stories can be very heavy. No, no site will be slowed down at all by anything um, because SlickPix hosts all the content. Easy for businesses of any size to promote themselves, including the mom and pops on the Facebooks. What's in it for the entrepreneurs and the local attractions? Easy drag and drop, interactive multimedia stories, just as easy as social sharing on Facebook. Um, easy collaboration channel on Discord, meaning that they can they can have collaboration with people that are not even part of the Main Street Maine, but also people that are creating um, stories on Slick Picks. Shareable on multiple channels, even if they're not on them. So for example, a mom and pop shop uh, is only on Facebook, but now those social channels, their, their viewers um, are going to be able to share on Instagram and Pinterest and LinkedIn. So the, it's going to be giving even the mom and pop shops a very large footprint with those social sharing icons. Richer stories, as you saw with um, the stories I just demonstrated. And then let's say the Taste of Maine would like to have that story integrated onto their website. They can. Those stories can be integrated on their own website, and then they can be dynamic and changed right away. Uh, what's in it for the state of Maine's tourism? Uh, we, we address four of the points of their destination management plan. So we help um, them with the collaboration piece. We help them with the storytelling piece. We help the uh, lesser known hidden gems be, be known and also um, promotion of the uh, local makers, um, uh, which are actually downtown Main Street main businesses many times, right? Um, so at this point, I'm going to wrap it up. I uh, just wanted to tell you that we are giving a Slick Picks one year subscription giveaway for one of the towns of uh, the downtown main streets. Um, so uh, AJ is uh, going to be putting the, the link in the chat, but here is a, a page that you can learn a lot more about the interactive maps for downtown main streets. Um, and it goes into detail um, 
uh, you can play with the technology as well and some of the content that I be would have been uh, demonstrating to you today. Um, and at that point, I'm going to wrap it up and say thank you for your time and thank you for the ability to present our innovative, interactive, multimedia storytelling platform. And I hope you guys have lots of questions for me. So thank you <laughs> very much. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks so much. Great job, job in our small time frame. And we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, one clarifying question for the giveaway. That's that's really awesome. Um, is it just for the 10 certified main streets or is it open to all downtown communities? Um, we've got some affiliates represented on this call as well. So just want to clarify. For all. For and, all. Cool. So maybe any M MDC member or community. Okay, great. Yes. Yes, we'll and um, and AJ AJ will put the, uh, any links that there are in the chat, and then we've created a page specifically for you guys, so you can, um, you know, play around with the technology and see how it works. And um, and right now we're looking for feedback on what you liked, what you didn't like, um, and uh, how useful it can be. Um, so any any feedback would be amazing for us, and we appreciate it. So hopefully you guys have some questions and, and um and uh in that so yeah i can't see, and, see the chat so if there's any questions if you can i'll, I'll just um i'll yeah, uh, yeah. Un undo my screen here no questions so, in the chat yet but anybody who's got a question dave and go ahead i, I think amy may have had her hand up first also. <laughs> oh thanks i, 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 I didn't do the electronic that. one yeah right <laughs> <laughs> thanks um, dave. amy go ahead um for I'm wondering how micro this can be. Like, can you focus on just like a mill building, which is you mean very far, mysterious? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. So you're talking about making it interactive or about the multimedia story about it? Um, so the mill we have, building. Okay. Yeah, we have a, we have a, a very large mill in downtown Westbrook and it, um, that everybody says it's such an like there's such amazing artists in there and, and nobody knows who they are. <laughs> yes. So um so yes, you can what you you know what you could do. I mean you can go if you had it on a map on a map, you can have here's here's where the mill is and then you can drill down into the mill. Here's the first level, here's the second level, here's the third level. I mean I've never been to it. I'm just imagining, right? So and then you can say here are the businesses on that. And each one of those artists then can display what they're creating at this point. And maybe they sell that piece that they created. Well, guess what? They can go in and change it. And all of a sudden they have a new piece in there, which keeps their, their content really fresh and dynamic. And a lot of times um, if they're really small, they maybe only have a presence on Facebook. Um, and a lot of times that content gets buried, right? So um, this will keep things really agile and fresh. Um, and then they can keep reposting that story. If they don't sell it, they can keep reposting and keep it on the top of everyone's feeds. So I hope that answers your question. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks, Joan. I'm, I'm wondering, you talked a lot about essentially the integration with social channels and um, and also kind of that that user journey story that you, that you mapped. We're talking a lot with a lot of our small business owners about connected commerce and shoppable social, and thinking about um, how all those things kind of um, converge for them with their limited uh, bandwidth. So I'm wondering, can we pull in like shoppable kind of um, social into an interactive story that we're building out and keep them on platform um, or do or is that something that we would need to kind of exp explore later on? Because one of the one of the big challenges I think for um, for us is we don't want to have to like be driving people all over the place. Like we want, to, and for a lot of our small business owners, like they just they don't understand some of the the, the back end components of it. Here, I think that was some of the points that you were making earlier. So we're so so it would be great to understand if we're able to pull in some of those shoppable social links across their different landscape into some kind of interactive. Um, experience that we could build on your platform and then tie into the the other the second half of that question is you mentioned G, g4 analytics like could we then also pull in some of those social analy analytics into that dashboard exactly yeah so um so the stories um themselves can can be made um and there's can can be linked to anything so you can link right within the story you can link to any of the facebooks or any of that and i, I maybe i misunderstood the question but um, 
but so if we have link like so so if um if, they, if somebody has a catalog on on insta oh. uh, right mm -hmm. and so we want to essentially pull in and so we essentially like when somebody is experiencing something through a select slick like experience can, mm -hmm. can they sh we I, I guess the direct question is like could we make them could we help that user experience along by allowing them to shop that sociable link and not have to take them off platform by pulling in the catalog that's already built out in meta yes so um now instagram is a different piece and many of you probably already know that instagram a lot of times like the link the um, posts and reels are not shoppable so what we what we've done is they allow one link off of instagram you can't make a you can't make your um interactive images on instagram or on facebook or any of that right they won't allow that so but what you can do is there that one link that is off instagram you can be brought to an interactive gallery which looks exactly like instagram so in one click each of the items on each of the posts and each of the reels becomes shoppable at that point. So it sort of ties, it, it helps the, the user experience go from awareness on Instagram to conversion in one click. So, and I'm not sure if that answered the question. Maybe AJ, if you wanna pipe in, um, are you there? Um, sorry, I was just responding to questions. Um... Can oh, you okay. Also, I'm happy to take it. I'm, ha I'm also happy to take it offline if other. I don't want to. I don't want to. Um, this yeah, is a, this, this is a. This will be an important thing to work through with some of the projects that we're talking about. So maybe we just we just take it offline if it's not helpful for the rest of the the group. I'm totally. That would be it. amazing. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm. I'm sorry. I may not have understood the question exactly, but um. No, that's but, all yeah. good. No, no, no. All good. Yep, yeah. All right, take it we are at time, so um, it looks like maybe there was a question that was I didn't I didn't see in the chat. Anne, Anne's question, but um, there are some questions about yearly fees, but I think I will just ask that you connect with Joan <clears throat> either at the end, if you plan to stay on Joan or sure. um, after, after we're done with the zoom, just so I can keep us on track and hand it over to Joe. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Joan, thank, thank you, you guys so for your much. time and, and your questions. And I will stay on um, after, after the, um, the call if anybody has any additional questions or I can in include my my information in the chat as well. So thank that you very much. Great. If you could include that information um, and send me your slides, if you want them to be sent out to this group, um, then we'll mm -hmm. set them up as follow-up. Exactly. And I've created a slick pick story of the slides. So cool. it's going to make it easy, Inclu cool. including social sharing. So feel free to share. No. <laughs> <laughs> great. Thanks so much, Joan. Thank you. And next, I'm going to turn it over to Joe, who's here from TECD to talk about some um, ARPA support for new businesses. Yep. Um, that's going to be a hard one to follow up because my slides are nowhere near as <laughs> as that. But um, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Let's see. Okay. Can you guys see my slide here? Yes. All right. There we go. That fancy view there. So um, what I wanted to talk about today or what Julia uh Julia Trio Lenguo, and I probably butchered that. Um, she is the one who will kind of oversees our economic recovery hubs, which is our primarily primary active um, project for small business investments and small business technical assistance throughout the state. Um, what I want to talk about first is, so this is just kind of a snapshot of the funds that have been distributed across our various economic recovery hubs within the state. Um, and I guess I should back up and say that an economic recovery hub, the approach we took with with this was we had about we had four different four different business cases that we were charged with enacting. Um, we had one that was primarily on economic recovery grants, which was approximately um, six million dollars for direct grants to small businesses. We had one for technical assistance, which is for helping out the providing assistance to those businesses that may not have the infrastructure that would allow them to prepare the documents necessary for applying for some of these 
or who may not have experience with things like bookkeeping or with um, marketing, that kind of thing. This was something that the hubs could use to provide that technical assistance to their applicants or to the businesses in their region. Then we had um, two diversity pieces that were specific towards trying to get the funds out to our DEI communities and our underrepresented communities, including women-owned businesses and veteran-owned businesses. Um, and those were, again, for technical assistance, and then one was for entrepreneurial assistance. And I guess one thing that separates the recovery hubs from other programs we've done in the past, like the main small business recovery grants that were done um, last year, is these are specific for new businesses. So those businesses that started after 20, after March of 2020, or I'm sorry, after January 1st of 2020, and so may not have had the background or the financials available to qualify for some of the other programs. So this was kind of a, 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 a safety net to catch those that may not have otherwise been applicable. They are also not as restrictive as some of the grants that have come out of FAME or out of MTI that have also been funded through the ARPA program. Um, and for those who don't know, the ARPA program is the American Rescue Plan Act um, that brought almost a billion dollars into the state. And out of that, DECD has approximately 240-ish million dollars that we're trying to get out through various programs. Um, the hubs that we've created each represent a, a different region within the state. So we have Androscoggin Valley, Central Maine uh, Growth Council, Eastern Maine Development Corporation. All of these, these hubs serve as the primary source for the funding. So they're the ones who distribute the funds. They're the ones who um, coordinate the efforts of their various that are going on throughout their region in order to make sure that they're getting the getting the word out there as much as they can. With the hubs, <clears throat> they've been charged with creating spokes within those regions. And part of the reason we we kind of decentralized this this power or the governance of this to the hubs was because we realized that what works in one county or what works in one region of Maine may not work in another region of Maine. So we wanted to provide as much freedom as we could to tailor the programs to the specific needs of their communities. To date, <clears throat> and this is specific on the recovery grant funds, this is kind of what it looks like as far as the amounts that have been awarded versus what's remaining out of those small business grants. Um, we have a couple on there. The ones that have zeros, the Androscoggin, Cal uh, Androscoggin, the Greater Portland and Southern Maine, those are ones that recently launched and those are getting ready to announce or have recently announced their programs. So they've not actually made the awards as of today or as of the time that these slides were created. Um, we expect that to be changing. But as you can see, we've been putting the money, the money has been getting out into the communities. Awards are being made to small businesses. Um, and again, those are through these hub organizations. And these are the primary hubs we have. We're also partnered with um, Black Owned Maine for those areas that were not, that didn't have the, the experience working with traditionally underrepresented groups, uh, DEI communities, um, women owned businesses, et cetera. And they're, they're working to provide the, that technical assistance piece in those regions. And again, it's, it's one of those things, the technical assistance for me is really the biggest piece that we're putting out there and the part that really makes this important because it's helping those small mom and pop businesses who may not, you know, who may have QuickBooks or maybe operating off of a, an Excel spreadsheet. Yet when they go to apply for these grants, they've still got all the requirements that another, another, uh, bigger business like WEX or IDEX might have, and they might not have a dedicated accounting staff. And so the technical assistance piece is to kind of bridge that, that knowledge gap in those communities and kind of set them up for success so that even if they're not getting funds here, 
their businesses are better situated for additional programs that'll be coming out in the future. Um, not just federal, but also state funded programs. <clears throat> so again, this is, and I've, I'm going to be pro, uh, providing these slides to Sylvie so that she can distribute them afterwards. But this is just kind of a basic rundown of the four elements that make up our economic recovery hubs, which is kind of a basic description of what they cover. And then I've also added the the link down there for the main uh, MJ, the main jobs and recovery plan uh, web page, which is a primary page where you can find all of the grant programs that are being done throughout the state of Maine, not just DECD's programs, but Department of Ag, Department of Labor, all of them that are being, that are currently underway through the, that are sponsored by the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Um, one of, one that, another one that I would like to point out on here, or not on here, but another one that I'd like to point out is we also have a domestic trade program, um, and that one is was just recently announced and launched. Uh, the Greater, Port Greater Portland uh, Council of Governments is they're managing that for us. Uh, they're going to be taking in the applications, reviewing the applications, making the awards, um, and that's six million dollars. Um, that is gonna be available to small businesses to increase their domestic trade footprint. So to help with going to trade shows, to help with marketing efforts, to help with getting their goods, to expanding the, the available market for their specific goods. Um, and again, through the main jobs and recovery plan website, you can find all the details that you need on that. And then I've also got, some contact information for the various hubs that are going to be in these slides so you can reach out to the folks that are actually managing each one of these hub programs. Um, and again, this is just a small piece of the funds that we've been able to distribute thus far from the American Rescue Plan Act for businesses within Maine. Um, the distribution of these funds is has been really good so far. Um, we've gotten them all over the state. If we, you know, when we plot, when we plot everything on the map to see where we're making the awards, there's a good distribution of these awards. Um, we've distributed approximately 58 million through fame. We're working on finishing up $20 million through, uh, the main technology Institute. We've got the domestic trade programs. And again, um, just really want to make everyone aware of these that we're we've got the funds the funds are coming out we do have they are on a time crunch because because of the federal the federal regulations for the arpa programs funds have to be committed by the end of by december 31st of 2024 and then which means they have to be awarded. There has to be a contract in place. There has to be a purchase order, et cetera. But then we have until 2020, the end of 2026 to actually get those funds expended. But it's that first date, that that December 24 date, that is the, the one that's coming up. So you're going to see a lot of traffic, not just from DECD, but from other agencies within the state as well as we go forward. Um. I know that was fast, but <laughs> uh, I wanted to make sure I have a, I have enough room for questions on this, because um, generally whenever we talk about getting money out to the state, we've got a lot of questions that come up. So, um, yeah, I'll just Thanks, Joe. open the floor. Thanks, Joe. That's great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I don't see, think I see any hands, so feel free to take yourselves off mute if you've got a question. Stop sharing here. And again, these slides, Sylvie's got these slides so that mm -hmm. she can send them out afterwards. Absolutely, along with um, your contact. Any questions for Joe? Christina. Sure, I have a question. Um, so we, um, so I knew that the Growth Council had funding. So I'm up in Skowhegan. Um, and uh, we, we work with the Growth Council on, uh, we're regionally partnered on, in like a hub and spoke model for our entrepreneurial ecosystem building. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I was under the impression that the, the funds that they were giving out were just for businesses only, but the technical assistance or like the entrepreneurial assistance funds, can you just talk a little bit more about those? Because we, we provide technical assistance in Skowhegan um, to our local entrepreneurs. And I'm just, is there opportunity for us to apply to the Central Maine Growth Council for those, for some funding to help support our work here? Or is, is that how, I, am I just incorrect on that? So no, and it's, the technical assistance piece that's provided to the hubs to pro to help pay for technical assistance outreach in the in their region so that would be hiring hiring a um you know having entrepreneurs and residents helping to cover the the cost of that covering the cost of training programs that they might need to implement in the region based on demand or that they want to offer or make available to businesses in their region um, I would recommend reaching out directly to the Central Maine Growth Council if there is a need or if there's something that you think would be a good use of those funds. Because, like I said, we're we've kind of set the left and right limits on these on these funds, saying this is what they should be spent for. But we're really trying not to micromanage how they implement it in their region because we we want the we want it to work in the region and we realize that each region within Maine has its own unique requirements. Does that answer your question without answering your question? Um, kind of, uh, but the, I was actually referring to the line of um, funding that you had on the slide under technical assistance. And I apologize for saying technical assistance, the one that was um, slated for entrepreneurship, I think it was. Yes. What are, what are, can you talk about those funds a little bit more? Please? Yeah. And I'm going to have to, yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties at home. One of my monitors seems to be blinking in and out. Um, so the entrepreneurial training um, is specific for um, entrepreneurs from DEI and BIPOC communities and other underrepresented backgrounds. And that support is, again, it's that, it's to provide that guidance in those areas. It's not necessarily, it's not like startup capital funds um, that we would have here. This is because of the way that the businesses have to be, a, they they have to have been started or have to be opened um, after that 20, or that January 1st, 21 date or 2020 date, but there's still some rules in there regarding how we spend those funds. But Primarily, again, those aren't, it's not so much a grant funding as much as it's a, this is, well, it's a grant funding, but to the hub so that the hub can provide those services or help pay for those services throughout the region. Uh, quick question. Um, I am, a, SADC is a spoke for NMDC for this program. Um, mm -hmm. And we haven't had a committee meeting to talk about um, grantees since um, we signed on, but um, I, sh I, I didn't ask this question before. So the ones that are eligible for COVID related uh, type of funds, are they disqualified if they receive PP, uh, the payroll protection funds already? So they're not outright, they're not outright um, ineligible for the funds because they've received funds previously. I will say that what we cannot do with regard to federal funds is you can't pay for the same thing twice right. um, using the funds and we can't commingle the funds on a project. And so what we have said is we want these funds to primarily go to those businesses that have not not been able to receive right. aid thus far. That was kind of the, sure. the birthplace for these. For the so when we're reviewing funds. the applications, give weight more weight to the ones that haven't already received funds. Okay. Right. That would be the that would be the intent. Okay. Any other questions? This is the easiest Joe? ARPA pro, ARPA talk I have been able to <laughs> give so far. So <laughs> normally there's things being thrown at me or um <laughs> the friendly group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. I don't see Newport represented, which makes me a little sad, but we have scouting, uh, which is close. <laughs> yeah, they're they're not in our program. Um 
All right. Well, Joe, thank you so much. And again, I'll send out those slides, Joe's contact, um, along with Julia's as well. And yep. we really and appreciate please, joining us. Please feel free to reach out with any questions or concerns regarding this, or if you need clarification or you're not, you're having problems getting a hold of your, the hub that's responsible for your region. Um, we can, we can poke sticks and get people moving. Thanks, Joe. That's, that's great. That's important. Um, all right. Well, um, feel free to stay on with us, um, Joe and Joan. I think I will um, just honor Amanda's request for that that discussion topic because I think we've got ten minutes here, um, and it may be on other folks' minds. So if it's you know only truly 30, 90 seconds, um, we can engage there and then open it up to other questions if um, if you've got those. But on the present on the presentations, but Amanda, you want to cue us up? Thanks for thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, um, I know we all had our own unique perspectives on what happened last week, um, and mine may be a little more complicated. Um, I am the my home gig, volunteering in my uh, my home community is the I'm the school board chair for Richmond, um, and so when all of this was going down on Wednesday night, I was in talks with. Um, school and how to get the message out. And uh, you guys, it's, it, I'm going further than my time, I realize already, but um, we've recently become our own independent school district after withdrawing from an RFU. So there's still some systems and technologies that aren't working yet. Um, so not everybody got the text message about school being closed and all this stuff. So this is where I was at, not only in my mental frame of, of this is my, I don't live in my downtown community, I don't know if all of you do. Um, maybe I'm a rare beast in this crowd, um, but I have three children at home. I was worried about my own household safety, locking my doors, locking my car doors. I don't do that normally. And working with my, my own community for the school. A couple of days later, we were still in shelter in place where I live. And because um, we were right next to Bowdoin where this guy lived, and, you know, we had watched on Thursday night as his house was getting raided, and that was 20 minutes from my house. Very freaked out. Um, and so Friday, we had all just aged 40 years by then, and I, we decided to leave and go to Popham to get out. And so on our way down there, I got a call from um, one of my restaurant owners, who is a constant thorn in my side for one reason or another. And he has the dynamic where he's like, well, what does Main Street do for me? But then in the other hand, why aren't you doing more? Or what is, why didn't you do that? And I am relying on you for this. And I'm like, but what? <laughs> what? So he called and he's like, well, you know, I'm sitting here with this neighboring business and I'm wondering why Main Street isn't creating a, a platform for us to communicate our, our downtown messaging during this time. You know, who are we looking to for the the connectivity, which we always hang our hat on, right? And, um, you know, we want to get out a, a message about what we are doing collectively. And I was, I had pulled over on the side of the road with my whole family in the car and, you know, talked to him. And I was like, you know, everybody that I've seen on social media responding to this is doing something completely different. You know, one business is closed. One business is staying open to be the light in the darkness. One business is opening up halfway through the day. One business is only offering a limited menu. You know, I cannot, in this chaos, managing my own family and being distracted with the school, also provide everything for everybody at all the time. And um, they're looking for advice on where they should be looking to and I was like, you know, City of Bath should be responding for something. And the police department is responding, you know, with communication. Did anybody else get a guilt trip on top of dealing with their own family safety during this whole thing? I saw it a lot on the city's um, social media, you know, a lot of why didn't you and how haven't you yet? And your question just reminds me that 
I don't know why we didn't send each other a group text on Thursday morning at nine and say, hey, let's all get together and check in on this because it's impossible to handle your family, handle your own fear of guns, et cetera, and um, figure out solo what to do in response to your, bring your entire community together. So resonating with you, Amanda, and it doesn't necessarily occur to me to reach out to our group to say, let's brainstorm as soon as possible about this. I know our community, again, we're, we're obviously right in Rockland. We're, we're further up. We still most like pretty much the whole downtown shut down. That communication and that joint messaging all happened in, we have like a private downtown group that was pretty active. And so there was kind of unified organization there where all the businesses kind of all kind of did a check-in on like, Hey, what are you thinking about? Are we all going to close? Um, and so, um, I, I Rockland main street, we didn't, we didn't spearhead that. Like we could, like I got calls that were coming to me. I was like, Hey, there's an active conversation going on in the group. Like, and I would, I was sending them the link. Um, What's the platform met, for the group, Dave? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a private Facebook group. But I think we all yeah. have those in our downtown. Like we, yeah. it's our group, like we own it. Um, but that, but it, it was, it was very active. And so there was kind of like a unified, like, okay, we're all gonna, we're all gonna kind of close today. Um, uh, even though uh, I just, it, for many of the business owners, it felt like the right thing to do. And so that, that, that unified message went out really um, quickly. Um, it's I, interesting that you bring that up, David, because I had to tell him that there is that group in, in Bath. He's like, Whoa! you know, I'm like, but but it was weird. Our group didn't do the same thing your group did. My downtown businesses didn't jump into that and use it as a resource. So that helps me think maybe that could be brought up as a a place that people can talk to each other and come up with a group. But I mean, also just I know we're but I would also react to like we're all we're also. I mean, I'm an hour north of you, um, right? So it's like we obviously we're not reacting in the same kind of. Um, tense environment, right? Like my wife and I were commenting, like we we lived in Boston proper during the, the Boston Marathon bombings. And like, we were like, oh, this, we, we have friends that are in closer where you, where you are, right? And it was like, it felt very reminiscent of that where like we would call them sirens going on. Like they weren't, it was a very different lived experience up here in Rockland. So I guess that what I'm saying is it's not like, I just think the businesses were reacting more of like, oh, what's the right thing to do? I don't think it was as much a, a, a health and safety thing. Um, so I just would share that. Not that I don't, you know, what I mean, not that Rockland's yeah, a shining. Point. I just think they had a little bit more clarity because they weren't and as concerned. About when it comes to that connectivity, though, it, like the reality is that you, you, you know, you all do offer that space for connective communication, and um, it was up to the, your businesses to decide how to use it. And obviously, with this kind of thing, as you're, as you're illuminating, um, Amanda, like it, it affects us each individually differently, regionally differently. Like people's processing is going to be different, and so. I think it's, yeah, it can't be too much responsibility on one person or entity because um, it's it's going to be different in terms of that lived experience. Um, and yeah, Delilah, I'm glad you highlighted like, you know, this group is, is always here for each other. Um, I think I'm sure, you know, if Ross was here this morning, he would have um, some similar experience, you know, of uh, that, you know, personal, very close to home, as well as um, trying to, you know, balance that community responsibility. But anybody else? I don't think we've had a national level event since I've been here in this group. So, you know, maybe this highlights a little tiny void that if there is something, you know, I don't know, at that level where it's starting to show up outside of Maine, maybe we do check in and say, does anybody need anything even if that's all it is, you know, maybe somebody had a question or I don't know if I would have had a response to that. Well, do we get, a, I know we're at time, but I mean, we did, oh. a lot of us just during COVID, like we did, I mean, those things, I'm thinking about like those early days of COVID where that was felt like most of our job was like, Hey, are you posting a sign about washing your hands? Hey, are you, how are you in for Like, I feel like it's just hard. I feel like we've all, it's, it's, I know we're at time, but like, it just feels like, obviously that feels like forever ago, but if, I mean, Amanda, thinking back to those early days of the pandemic, like we kind of were doing that. I mean, I think for most of us, we were that centralized information source on like, Hey, what are you doing? Are you open? Are you closed? Like, are you requiring masks? Are you not? Are your employees washing hands? You know what I mean, 
And like we were, we were all communicating that to our downtown businesses before people even knew what was going to, I mean, we we're talking like flatten the curve two weeks kind of conversations. So I just, I, I would, I think we all got, we all were really good at that. And I think we've now moved on to other things. And so we forget how much we had to do that, th you know, three years ago. Yeah. Angie. This has me um, thinking about um, um, Anne's work with emer emergency preparedness. I know that that was disaster in the sense of a natural disaster. What do we do in our downtowns? But, um, you know, hopefully this never happens again, but, you know, it is kind of an emergency preparedness. Um, how do we respond to our down to our downtown business owners? Um, mm -hmm. Where Saco was specifically named, um, I think it was just kind of, the community just kind of was businesses made their own choice. There was no blame being made or, um, you know, kind of finding out what other people were doing, but they just made the call themselves. So a lot of businesses down here just kind of closed for those days until, until he was found. Um, and then of course, with the pumpkin harvest festival for us, we had to cancel that. Um, and there was just, it was, very well received and anybody we've seen since has been very supportive of it and said that it was the right call so that's a good feeling too um that the community was really kind of just standing together on on that sort of uh, response amy did you have something to add you know i think um situations like this accentuate um maybe something that is persistent with this role and it's the balance or lack of balance of boundaries um and what is the role of a main street director i mean what we do is everything and when you don't live in the community there there is that i i have the same issue like you you want to be all in and, and yet your life is then divided it, it's hard to um but I think when when they're specifically on big issues like this, like it's hard. It's hard to to set your priorities and figure out how to how to navigate this crazy, ever changing world. I did feel like everybody was just you're on your own. Everybody's out for themselves. Stay alive. Lock your door. And there wasn't like let's think about the strategic business message that we want to send. You know, that just was no time for that. We were on, we're watching the news, you know, every minute there was something different going on. And, um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I don't know. I think I just need to send out a message that there is a Facebook group. If you guys want to get organized about something, you go for it. Like, there it is. You know, and I think maybe that, that a communication that, you know, anything that has to do with, safety of the town falls on the police we are not safety enforcers <laughs> we are business development helpers <laughs> I, I know we're at, i know we're at time i think that i'm reacting to something okay. that Amy said but is um i think like during the pandemic especially in the early days like we became extremely accessible in ways that we had like that main street programs had never been and so for many of our downtown businesses like my personal cell is the easiest thing like i'm more responsive because of, again reacting to the way that we were managing those relationships during the pandemic when many of us like went from being mostly in person kind of interactions with our downtown businesses to getting stood up on these processes that now we all it's a baked into part of our our kind of work life processes. So for many of our downtown stakeholders, and I'm sure it's the same for you all, my cell is the quickest way they're gonna get an answer on anything. And because there weren't boundaries there, because during the pandemic, we weren't setting those boundaries, it's now bled into, you know, for always, like, you know what I mean? Like that will be continued. So it's about, I don't know, how, and this is something that I know Ann's not on the call anymore, but like something that Ann and I, Ann Ball and I have talked a ton about is like, how do you, how do you now set boundaries when in 2020, there were no boundaries. People got really used to just, calling your cell 24 seven, texting you being like, what's the update? Now, how do you set those boundaries three years later being like, oh, I'm gonna burn out if I don't set boundaries. Um, that's something that I know, you know, Sylvia, we've talked offline about, I've talked to Dan about. Um, so I think it's very, very real. Yeah. Are you looking for a suggestion? Because I would, I would send out an email to everybody and just say, these are my business hours. <laughs> Leave me alone otherwise. Yeah, I think that, I, yeah, I think for, we, and we're also touching on the living in the living, living, like, so my, it's not, I don't know, 
I, I, I mean, it sounds like we all have different situations. Like my social life, my social circle is very connected to the downtown, my job, you know what I mean? And so it's like, it's very hard. Like, what, yeah, you talk about kids, like when you're at a kid's birthday party, people are asking questions about what's going on with this. We, we are extremely accessible. Most of the municipality staff does not live in the downtown the way some of us live in our downtowns. You know what I mean? Anyway, sorry, I could keep going. This is a very personal thing for me. So I'll go, I'll. I well, I, I think question. it's important. I love, I love, I, I know I missed the last couple of these meetings. I apologize, but I think, I think there's always something to talk about and then always a question going on. And if we don't, if we don't have, um, you know, if you have a presentation and then a little bit of a time for us to ask questions, that might be a really great model for um, coming up. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah, we will. Um... I'll keep that in mind. We typically try to not schedule two, but it seems like that's happened more recently uh, with different requests, but it's a good reminder that, yeah, this open forum is important. Cara? Um, I have a question. Um, does anyone know, or when does the um, the conference schedule for um, the um, for Main Street uh, conference come out? And is there anyone on a national level talking about this and perhaps is there going to be a presentation at the at next year's conference about this? I mean, this happens all over our country. Um, and I don't specifically just mean gun violence. I just mean sort of natural, either natural disasters or anything that this encompasses. And um, how would we find out or, or when are we privy to what that lineup is? Um, you know, I do know that there has been talk around emergency preparedness. Um, that was something that came up after the Vermont um, flooding and um, something Anne kind of joined Kathy LaPlante on in Vermont as part of kind of her work, you know, looking at that in ways that um, from that Main Street perspective. Um, so it, it sounds like there should be something there. Uh, I think they really just... Um, you know, close the deadline on submissions for proposals. So we probably won't see like a final schedule um, for a bit. I think, you know, January might be the earliest. Um, those, of, those of you who have been through more than one year <laughs> of that calendar might know better than I, but um, since the conference isn't until May, um, I'd be surprised if we saw anything before January. Yeah, it just seems to me that this is sort of big stuff, uh, like mm -hmm. national stuff. And really um, having them address it would be timely and not just because of what just happened here in Maine, but just in general. Yeah. And just thinking of, um, let's see, I know, I don't know if Christina is actually still on, but with the community and Angie, maybe you were um, in one of those conversations. Now I'm forgetting the community kind of discussions that they're having, I'm trying to remember what the term they have for it is. But that that was the emergency preparedness was a topic that came up with one of those kind of focus groups that Main Street America is having with um, a couple of representatives from each state and community. Um, anyway, I know it seems to be a topic on, yeah, on everyone's radar. Um, but I'll certainly echo that with Kathy. Well, thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Um... You know, we're all in similar weird little boats. No, thanks for being vulnerable and raising it up to the group. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing it up, Amanda. And always, this space is always welcome, welcome for it and to it. And um, yeah, thanks. Th thanks for the engagement with it. Joe and AJ, I'll reach out to you offline so we can continue that conversation. Okay, great. Well, and Amanda, I just want to say I'm right across the bridge from you, so... <laughs> Yes, if you need, I, I need to give you a call anyway. So thank you for your presentation and for poking through the back map. That was awesome. Yeah, great. Thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Bye, right, guys. Hope you all take care. I'll echo Have a great weekend. sentiment of take care of yourselves this weekend. Yeah, thank you. Bye.